Chapter Fifteen of Stella Fragelius by H. Rider Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick Seventy Nine. Chapter Fifteen Three Interviews. The next day was a Sunday, and the Colonel went to church wearing a hat band four inches deep. Morris, however, declined to accompany him, saying that he had a letter to write to Mary, whereupon his father, who at first was inclined to be vexed, replied that he could not be better employed, and that he was to give her his love. Then he asked if Miss Fregelius was coming, but somewhat to his disappointment was informed that she wished to stay with her father. "'I wonder!' thought the colonel to himself, as he strolled to the church, now and again acknowledging greetings or stopping to chat with one of the villagers. I wonder if they're going to have a little sacred music together in the chapel. If so, upon my soul, I should like to make the congregation. And that pious fellow Morris too, the blameless Morris to go philandering about in this fashion. I hope it won't come to Mary's ears. But if it does, luckily, with all her temper, she is a sensible woman, and knows that even Jove nods at times. After the service the Colonel spoke to various friends, accepted their condolences upon the death of Mr. Pawson, and finally walked down the road with Eliza Layard. "'You must have found that all sorts of strange things have happened at the Abbey since you've been away, Colonel Monk,' she said presently, in a sprightly voice. Oh, "'Well, yes, at least, I don't know. I understand that Morris has improved that uh, blessed apparatus of his and the new parson and his daughter have floated to our doors like driftwood. Oh, by the way, have you seen Miss Fregelius? Oh, uh, seen her? Yes, I have seen her. She is a wonderfully captivating girl, isn't she? Oh, so unusual, and those great eyes of hers that seem to vary with the light. Like a cat's, snapped Eliza. The light within, I was going to say. Oh, I thought you meant the light without. Well, she may be fascinating to men, but as I am only a woman, I cannot be expected to appreciate that. You see, we look more to other things. Ah, well, so far as I am a judge, she seemed to me to be pretty well set up in them also. Oh, she has a marvellous voice, is certainly a first-class violinist, and I should say extremely well-read, especially in Norse literature. Oh, uh, I dare say she is a genius as well as a beauty. I gather, said the Colonel with a smile, that you do not like Miss Fregelius. As my acquaintance with her is limited, would you think me rude if I asked why? Oh, how can I be expected to like her, seeing— And she paused. Uh, uh, seeing what, Miss Layard? What? Uh, haven't you heard? I thought it was common property. He shook his head. I have heard nothing. Uh, go on, pray. Uh, this is quite interesting. Oh, that she led on that silly brother of mine until he proposed to her. Yes, he proposed to her, and then refused him. Stephen has been like a crazy creature ever since, moaning and groaning and moping, till I think that he will go off his head, instead of returning thanks to Providence for a merciful escape. The colonel set his lips as though to whistle, then checked himself. Under the circumstances, presumably them to be accurately stated, I am not prepared to say who is to be congratulated or who should thank Providence. 
oh, these things are so individual, are they not? But if one thing is clear, whatever else she is or is not, Miss Fregelius cannot be a fortune hunter, although she must want money. Oh, well, she may want other things more. Oh, perhaps. But I am very stupid. I am afraid I do not understand. Men, for instance, suggested Eliza. Oh, dear me, that sounds almost carnivorous. I am afraid that there are not many about here to satisfy her appetite. Your brother, Morris, the curate at Morton, and myself, if at my age I may creep into that honourable company, are the only single creatures within four miles, and from these Stephen and Morris must apparently be eliminated. Uh, why should Morris be eliminated? A reason may occur to you. Do you mean because he is engaged? Oh, what on earth does that matter? Oh, nothing in the East. But rightly or wrongly, we have decided upon a monogamous system. A man can't marry two wives, Miss Layard. But he can throw over one girl to marry another. Do you suggest that Morris is contemplating this experiment? I, I suggest nothing. All I know is, well, now, what do you know? If you wish me to tell you, as perhaps I ought to, I know this, Colonel Monk, that the other night, when I was driving along the rectory road, I saw your son, Mr. Monk, kissing this wonderful Miss Frigelius. That is all. And Stephen saw it also. You ask him. Oh, thank you. I think I would rather not. But what an odd place for him to choose for such an interchange of early Christian courtesies. Also, if you are not mistaken, how well it illustrates that line in the hymn this morning. How many a spot defiles the robe that wraps an earthly saint. Such adventures seem scarcely in Morris's line, and I should have thought that even an inexperienced saint would have been more discreet. Men always jest at serious things, said Eliza severely. Which do you mean, the saints or the kissing? Both are serious enough, but the two in combination? Oh, don't you believe me? asked Eliza. Of course, but could you give me a few details? Eliza could, and did, with amplifications. Now, what do you say, Colonel Monk? she asked triumphantly. I say that I think you have made an awkward mistake, Miss Layard. It seems to me that all you saw is quite consistent with the theory that he was buttoning or arranging the young lady's hood. I understand that the wind was very high that night. Eliza started. This was a new and unpleasant interpretation which she hastened to repudiate. Arranging her hood? Oh, indeed! When he might have been kissing her. You cannot understand such moderation. Still, it is possible, and he ought to have the benefit of the doubt. Witnesses to character would be valuable in such a case, and his, not to mention the ladies, is curiously immaculate. Oh, of course you are entitled to your own opinion, but I have mine. Suddenly the Colonel changed his bantering, satirical tone, and became stern and withering. Miss Layard, he said, does it occur to you that on evidence which would not suffice to convict a bicyclist of riding on a footpath, you are circulating a scandal, of which the issue might be very grave to both the parties concerned? Uh, I am not circulating anything. I, I, I was telling you privately, replied Eliza, still trying to be bold. I am glad to hear it. I understand that neither you nor your brother have spoken of this extraordinary tale, 
and I am quite certain that you will not speak of it in the future. I cannot answer for my brother, she said sulkily. No, but in his own interest, and in yours, I trust that you will make him understand that if I hear a word of this, I shall hold him to account. Also, that his propagation of such a slander will react upon you, who were with him. Uh, uh, how? asked Eliza, now thoroughly frightened, and when he chose, the colonel could be very crushing. Thus, your brother's evidence is that of an interested person which no one will accept, and of yours, Miss Layard, it might be inferred that it was actuated by jealousy of a charming and quite innocent girl, or perhaps by other motives even worse, which I would rather you did not ask me to suggest. Eliza did not ask him. She was too wise, and as she knew well, when roused the colonel was a man with a bitter tongue and a good memory. I am sure I am the last person who would wish to do any mischief, she said in a humble voice. Of course, I know that, I know that. Well, now we understand each other, so I must be turning home. Thank you so much for having been quite candid with me. Good morning, Miss Layard. Remember me to Stephen? A oh, few, reflected the colonel to himself, the battle is won after a fashion, but just about forty-eight hours too late. By this time that vixen of a woman has put the story all over the place. Oh, Morris, you egregious ass! If you wanted to take to kissing like a schoolboy, why the deuce did the you select the high road for the purpose? This must be put a stop to. I must take steps, and at once. They mustn't be seen together again, or there will be trouble with Mary. Hmm, but how do I do it? How to do it? That is the question, and one to which I must find an answer within the next two hours. Oh, what a kettle of fish! What a kettle of fish! In due course, and after diligent search, he found the answer to his question. At lunchtime, the colonel remarked casually that he had walked a little way with Miss Layard, who mentioned that she had seen them, that is, his son and Miss Fregelius, struggling through the gale of the other night. Then he watched the effect of this shot. Morris moved his chair and looked uncomfortable. Clearly he was a most transparent sinner, but on Stella it took no effect. As usual, reflected the colonel, the lady has the most control, or perhaps he tried to kiss her and she wouldn't let him, and a consciousness of virtue gives her strength. After lunch the colonel paid a visit to Miss Fregelius ostensibly to talk to him about the proposed restoration of the chancel, for which he, as holder of the great tithes, was jointly liable with the rector, a responsibility that, in the altered circumstances of the family, he now felt himself able to face. When this subject was exhausted, which did not take long, as Mr. Fregelius refuses to express any positive opinion till he had inspected the church, the colonel's manner grew portentously solemn. "'My dear sir,' he said, "'there is another matter, a somewhat grave one, upon which, for both our sakes and the sakes of those immediately concerned, I feel bound to say a few words.' Mr. Fregelius, who was a timid man, looked very much alarmed. A conviction that the grave matter had something to do with Stella flashed into his mind, but all he said was, um, "'I am afraid I don't understand, uh, Colonel Monk. No, indeed, how should you? 
well to come to the point it has to do with that very charming daughter of yours and my son morris oh i feared as much groaned the clergyman indeed i thought you said you did not understand no but i guessed wherever stella goes things seem to happen exactly well things have happened here to be brief i mean that a lot of silly women have got up a scandal about them no 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 scandal is too strong a word gossip oh what is alleged asked mr fregelius faintly well that your daughter threw over that young ass stephen layard because a story seems to be incredible i admit she had fallen violently in love with morris further that she and the said morris were seen embracing at night on the rectory road which i don't believe as the witnesses are layard who is prejudiced and his sister who is the most ill-bred bitter and disappointed woman in the county lastly and this is no doubt true that they are generally on terms of great intimacy and we all know where that leads to between a man and a woman plato thy confounded fantasies etc etc you see when people sit up singing to each other alone till two in the morning i i, I don't mean morris sings he has no more voice than a crow he does the appreciative audience well other people will talk won't they i suppose so the world being what it is sighed mr fregelius exactly the world being what it is and men and women what they are a most ungenerate lot and au fond very primitive as i dare say you may have observed oh, what is to be done well under the circumstances i should have said nothing at all except congratulate them most heartily more especially my son but in this case there are reasons which make such a course impossible as you know morris is engaged to be married to my niece miss porson and it is a contract which even if he wished it honour would forbid him to break for family as well as for personal reasons oh quite so quite so it is not to be thought of but again i ask what is to be done is that not rather a question for you to consider i suggest that you had better speak to your daughter just a hint you know just a hint uh, upon my word i would rather not oh stella can be so decided at times and we never seem quite to understand each other i did speak to her the other day when mr layard wished to marry her a match i was naturally anxious for but the results were not satisfactory still i think you might try oh very well very well i will try and colonel monk i cannot tell you how grieved i am to have brought all this trouble on you oh not a bit answered the colonel cheerfully i am an old student of human nature and i rather enjoy it it's like watching puppets on a stage only we mustn't let the comedy grow into a tragedy ah that's what i'm afraid of some tragedy oh, stella is a woman who takes things hard and if any affection really has sprung up well it will no doubt evaporate with the usual hysterics and the morning headache oh bless me i have known dozens of them and felt some myself in my time the, the headaches i mean not the other things 
Now, don't be alarmed if she gets angry, Mr. Fregelius, but just appeal to her reason. She will see the force of it afterwards. An hour or so later, the Colonel started for a walk on the beach to look at some damage which the high tide had done to the cliff. As it was nearing the abbey steps, on his return, he saw the figure of a woman standing quite still upon the sands. An inspection through his eyeglass revealed that it was Stella, and instinct told him her errand. Oh, this is rather awkward, he thought to himself, as he braced himself to battle, especially as I like the girl, and I don't want to hurt her feelings. Oh, hello, Miss Frigelius. Are you taking the air? You should walk, or you, or you will catch cold. Oh, no, Colonel Monk. I was waiting for you. Oh, waiting for me? Me? <laughs> oh, this is indeed an honour, and one which age appreciates. She waved aside his two-edged badinage. You have been speaking to my father, she said. Instantly the Colonel assumed a serious manner, not the most serious, such as he wore at funerals, but still one suited to a grave occasion. "'Yes, I have.' "'You remember all that you said?' Uh, "'Certainly, Miss Frigelius, and I assume that for the purposes of this conversation it need not be repeated.' She bowed her head and replied, I have come to explain and to tell you three things. First, that all these stories are false, except about the singing. Secondly, that whoever is responsible for them has made it impossible that I should live in Monksland. So I am going to London to earn my own living there. And thirdly, that I hope you will excuse my absence from dinner, as I think the more I keep to myself, until we go to-morrow, the better, though I reserve to myself the right to speak to Mr. Monk on this subject and to say good-bye to him. She is taking this hard, and she is fond of him, deuced fond of him. Oh, poor girl, thought the Colonel, but aloud he said, Oh, my dear Miss Fregelius, I never believe the stories. As for the principal one, common sense rebels against it. All I said to your father was that there appears to be a lot of talk about the place, and under the circumstances of my son's engagement, that he might perhaps give you a friendly hint. Oh, indeed, he did not quite put it like that. He gave me to understand that you had told him that I was so, so much in love with Mr. Monk that on this account I had rejected Mr. Layard. Oh, oh, please keep walking, said the Colonel, or you really will catch cold. Then suddenly he stopped, looked her sharply in the face, much as he had done to Eliza, and said, Well, and are you not in love with him? For a moment Stella stared at him indignantly. Then suddenly he saw a blush spread upon her face to be followed by an intense pallor, while the pupils of the lovely eyes enlarged themselves and grew soft. Next instant she put her hand to her heart, tottered on her feet, and had he not caught her would perhaps have fallen. "'I do not think I need trouble you to answer my question, which, indeed, now that I think of it, was one I had no right to put, he said as she recovered herself. Oh, my God, moaned Stella, wringing her hands. I never knew it till this moment. You have brought it home to me. You, yes, you. And she burst out weeping. Oh, here are these hysterics, thought the Colonel, and I am afraid that the headache will be bad to-morrow morning. To her, however, he said very tenderly, Oh, my dear girl, my 
dear girl, pray do not distress yourself. These little accidents will happen in the best regulated hearts, and believe me, you will get over it in a month or two. Accident, she said, it is no accident, it is fate. I see it all now, and I shall never get over it. However, that is my own affair, and I have no right to trouble you with my misfortunes. No, oh, but you will indeed, and though you may think the advice hard, I will tell you the best way. She looked up in inquiry. Change your mind and marry Stephen Layard. He is not at all a bad fellow, and, and there are obvious advantages. This was the Colonel's first really false move, as he himself felt before the last word had left his lips. Colonel Monk, she said, because I am unfortunate, is it any reason that you should insult me? Miss Fregelius, to my knowledge I have never insulted any woman, and certainly I should not wish to begin with one who has just honoured me with her confidence. Is it not an insult, she answered with a sort of sob, when a woman, to her shame and sorrow, has confessed what, what I have, to bid her console herself by marriage with another man? Oh, yes. Now that you put it thus, I confess that perhaps some minds might so interpret an intention which did not exist. It seemed to me that, after a while, in marriage you should most easily forget a trouble which my son so unworthily has brought on you. Oh, don't blame him, for he does not deserve it. If anybody is to blame, it is I. Oh, but in truth all these stories are false. We have neither of us done anything. Do not press the point, Miss Fregelius. I believe you. We have neither of us done anything, she repeated. And, what is more, if you had not interfered, I do not think that I should have found out the truth. Or at least not yet till I saw him married, perhaps, when it would have been no matter. Uh, when you see a man walking in his sleep, you do your best to stop him, said the Colonel, and so cause him to fall over the precipice and be dashed to bits. Oh, you should have let me finish my journey. Then I should have come back to the bed that I have made to lie on and wake to find myself alone, and nobody would have been hurt except myself, who caused the evil. The Colonel could not continue this branch of the conversation, even to him, a hardened vessel, as he had defined himself, it was too painful. Uh, you said you mean to earn a living in London. Well, how? Oh, by my voice and violin, if one can sing and play with a sore heart. I have an old aunt, a sister of my father's, who is a music mistress, with whom I dare say I can arrange to live, and who may be able to get me some introductions. Oh, well, I hope I can help you there, and I will to the best of my ability. Indeed, if necessary, I will go to town and see about things. Allow me to add this, Miss Fregelius, that I think you are doing a very brave thing, and what is more, a very wise one. And I believe that before long we shall hear of you as some great new contralto. She shrugged her shoulders. It may be... I don't care. Good-bye. Oh, by the way, I wish to see Mr. Monk once more before I go. It would be better for us all. I suppose that you don't object to that, do you? 
miss fregelius my son is a man advancing towards middle age it is entirely a point for you and him to decide and i will only say that i have every confidence in you oh thank you she answered and turning walked rapidly down the lonely beach till her figure melted into the gathering gloom on the winter's night once however when she thought that she was out of eyeshot he saw her stop with her face towards the vast and bitter sea and saw also that she was wringing her hands in the agony of utmost despair oh she looks like a ghost said the colonel aloud with a little shiver like a helpless homeless ghost with the world behind her and the infinite in front and nothing to stand on but a patch of shifting sand wet with her own tears when the colonel grew thus figurative and poetical it may be surmised by anyone who has taken the trouble to study his mixed and somewhat worldly character that he was deeply moved and he was moved more so indeed than he had been since the death of his wife why he would have found it hard to explain on the face of it the story was of a trivial order and in some of its aspects rather absurd two young people who happened to be congenial but one of whom was engaged chanced to be thrown together for a couple of months in a country house although there is some gossip nothing at all occurs between them beyond a little perfect natural flirtation the young man's father hearing the gossip speaks to the young lady in order that she may take steps to protect herself and his son against surmise and misinterpretation thereupon a sudden flood of light breaks upon her soul by which she sees that she is really attached to the young man and being a woman of unusual character or perhaps absurdly averse to lying even upon such a subject in answer to a question admits that this is so and that she very properly intends to go away could anything be more commonplace more in the natural order of events why then was he moved oh it was that woman's face and eyes old as he might be he felt jealous of his son jealous to think that for him such a woman could wear this countenance of wonderful and thrilling woe what was there in morris that it should have called forth this depth of passion undefiled now if there were no mary but there was a mary it was folly to pursue such a line of thought from sympathy for stella which was deep and genuine to anger with his son proved to the colonel an easy step morris was that worst of sinners a hypocrite morris being engaged to one woman had taken advantage of her absence deliberately to involve the affection of another or at any rate caused her considerable inconvenience he was wroth with morris and what was more before he grew an hour older he would let him have his peace of mind he found the sinner in his workshop the chapel making mathematical calculations the very sight of which added to his father's indignation the man he reflected to himself who under these circumstances could indulge an abnormal talent for mathematics especially on a sunday must be a cold-blooded brute he entered the place slamming the door behind him and morris looking up noted with alarm for he hated rouse that there was war in his eyes oh, won't you take a chair father he said no thank you i would rather say what i have to say standing what is the matter the matter is sir 
that I find that by your attentions you have made that poor girl, Miss Fregelius, while she was a guest in my house, the object of slander and scandal to every ill-natured gossip in these three parishes. Morris is quiet. Thoughtful eyes flashed in an ominous and unusual manner. "'If you were not my father,' he said, "'I should ask you to change your tone in speaking to me on such a subject. "'But as things are, I suppose that I must submit to it, "'unless you choose otherwise.' "'The facts, Morris,' answered his father, "'justify any language that I can use.' "'Did you get these facts from Stephen Layard or Miss Layard? "'Ah, I guessed as much. "'Well, the story is a lie. "'I was merely arranging her hood, "'which she could not do herself, "'as the wind forced her to use her hand to hold her dress down.' "'The thought of his own ingenuity "'in hitting on the right solution in the story "'mollified the Colonel not a little.' Pah, he said, I knew that. Do you suppose that I believed you fool enough to kiss a girl upon the open road when you had every opportunity of kissing her at home? I know, too, that you have never kissed her at all, or ostensibly, at any rate, done anything that you shouldn't do. Oh, what is my offence, then? asked Morris. "'Your offence is that you have got her talked about, "'that you have made her in love with you. "'Oh, don't deny it. "'I have it from her own lips, "'that you have driven her out of this place "'to earn a living in London as best she may, "'and that, being yourself an engaged man.' "'Here once more the Colonel drew a bow at a venture. "'You are what is called in love with her yourself.' These two were very easy victims to the skill of so inexperienced an archer. The shaft went home between the joints of his son's harness, and Morris sank back in his chair and turned white. Generosity, or perhaps the fear of exciting more unpleasant consequences, prevented the Colonel from following up this head of his advantage. "'There is more!' "'A great deal more behind,' he went on. "'For instance, all this will probably come to Mary's ears. "'But suddenly it will. "'I shall tell her of it myself, "'which will be tantamount to breaking your engagement. "'May I ask if that is your intention?' "'No. "'But supposing that all you say were true "'and that it was my intention, well, what then?' "'Then, sir, to my old-fashioned ideas, you would be a dishonourable fellow "'to cast away the woman who has only you to look up to in the world, "'that you may put another woman who has taken your fancy in her place?' "'Morris bit his lip. "'Still speaking on that supposition,' he replied, "'would it not be more dishonourable to marry her?' Would it not be kinder, shameful as it may be, to tell her all the truth and let her seek some worthier man? The colonel shrugged his shoulders. I can't split hairs, he said, or enter on an argument of sentimental casuistry. But I tell you this, Morris, although you are my only son and the last of our name, that rather than do such a thing, under all circumstances, it will be better that you should take a pistol and blow your brains out. Very probably, answered Morris. But would you mind telling me also what are the exact circumstances which would, in your opinion, so aggravate this particular case? You have a copy of your Uncle Pawson's will in that drawer. Give it to me. Morris obeyed, and his father searched for and read the following sentence. In consideration of the forthcoming marriage between his son Morris and my daughter Mary, 
the said testator remits all debts and obligations that may be due to his estate by the said Richard Monk, Lieutenant Colonel, Companion of the Bath, and an executor of this will. Well, said Morris. Well, replied the Colonel coolly, those debts in all amounted to nineteen thousand five hundred and forty three pounds. No wonder you seem astonished, but they have been accumulating for a score of years. There's the fact. Anyway, so discussion is no use. Now, do you understand? In consideration of the forthcoming marriage, remember? Well, I shall be rich some day. That machine you laugh at will make me rich. Already I have been approached. I might repay this money. Yes, and you might not. Such hopes and expectations have a way of coming to nothing. Besides, hang it all, Morris, you know that there is more than money in the question. Morris hid his face in his hands for a moment. When he removed them, it was ashen. Yes, he said, things are unfortunate. You remember that you were very anxious that I should engage myself, and Mary was so good as to accept me. Perhaps, I cannot say, I should have done better to have waited till I had felt some real impulse towards marriage. However, that is all gone by. And, Father, you need not be in the least afraid. There is not the slightest fear that I shall attempt to do anything of which you would disapprove. I was sure you wouldn't, old fellow, answered the Colonel in a friendly tone. Not when you came to think. Matters seem to have got into a bit of a tangle, don't they? Most unfortunate, that charming young lady being so brought to this house in such a fashion. Really, it looks like a spite of what she called fate. However, I have no doubt that it will all straighten itself somehow. Oh, uh, by the way, she told me that she should wish to see you once to say good-bye before she went. Don't be vexed with me if, should she do so, I suggest to you to be very careful. Your position will be exceedingly painful and exceedingly dangerous, and in a moment all your fine resolutions may come to nothing, though I am sure that she does not wish any such thing. Oh, poor dear! Unless she really seeks this interview, I think, indeed, it would be best avoided. Morris made no answer and the Colonel went away somewhat weary and sorrowful. For once he had seen too much of his puppet show. End of chapter 15 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 16 of Stella Fragelius by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick seventy nine. Chapter sixteen A Marriage and After. Stella did not appear at dinner that night, or at breakfast next day. In the course of the morning, growing impatient, for he had explanations to make, Morris sent her a note worded thus. "'Can I see you? M. M.' To which came the following answer. Uh, "'Not to-day. Meet me to-morrow, at the dead church, at three o'clock. Stella.' It was the only letter that he ever received from her. That afternoon, December the 23rd, Mr. Fregelius and his daughter moved to the rectory in a fly that had been especially prepared to convey the invalid without shaking him. 
Morris did not witness their departure, as the Colonel, either by accident or design, had arranged to go with him on this day to inspect the new buildings which had been erected on the Abbey Farm. Nor, indeed, were the names of the departed guests so much as mentioned at dinner that night. The incident of their long stay at the Abbey, with all its curious complications, was closed, and both father and son, by tacit agreement, determined to avoid all reference to it, at any rate for the present. The Christmas Eve of that year will long be remembered in Monksland, and all that stretch of coast as the day of the great gale, which wrought so much damage on its shores. The winter's dawn was of extraordinary beauty, for all the eastern sky might have been compared to one vast flower, with a heart of burnished gold, and sepals and petals of many-coloured fires. Slowly from a central point it opened. Slowly its splendours spread across the heavens, then suddenly it seemed to wither and die, to where it had been was nothing but masses of grey vapour that arose, gathered, and coalesced in an ashen pall, hanging low above the surface of the ashen sea. The Coast Guard, watching the glass, hoisted their warning cone, although as yet there was no breath of wind and the old sailormen, hanging about in knots on the cliff and beach, went to haul up their boats, as high as they could drag them, knowing that it would blow hard that night. About midday the sea began to be troubled, as though its waves were being pushed on by some force as yet unseen, and before two o'clock gusts of cold air from the northeast travelled landwards off the ocean, with a low moaning sound, which was very strange to hear. As Morris trudged along towards the dead church, he noticed, as we do notice such things when our minds are much preoccupied and oppressed, that these gusts were coming quicker and quicker, although separated from each other by periods of aerial calm. Then he remembered that a great gale had been prophesied in the weather reports, and thought to himself that they portended its arrival. He reached the church by the narrow spit of sand and shingle which connected it to the shore, passed through the door in the rough brick wall, closing it behind him, and paused to look. Already under that heavy sky the light which struggled through the brine-encrusted eastern window was dim and grey. Presently, however, he discovered the figure of Stella, seated in her accustomed place by the desolate-looking stone altar, whereupon stood the box containing the aerophone that they had used in their experiments. She was dressed in her dark-coloured ulster, of which the hood was still drawn over her head, giving her the appearance of some cloaked nun, lingering, out of time and place, in the ruined habitations of her worship. As he advanced, she rose and pushed back the hood, revealing the masses of her waving hair, to which it had served her as a sole covering. In silence Stella stretched out her hand, and in silence Morris took it, for neither of them seemed to find any words. At length she spoke, fixing her sad eyes upon his face, and saying, You understand that we meet to part. I am going to London tomorrow. My father has consented. That is Christmas Day, he faltered. Yes. But there is an early strain, the same that runs on Sunday. Then there was a pause. I wish to ask your pardon, he said, for all the trouble that I have brought upon you. She smiled. I think it is I who should ask yours. You have heard these stories. Oh, yes, my father spoke to me. He told me of his conversation with you. All of it? 
I do not know. Well, I suppose so. And he hung his head. Oh, she broke out in a kind of cry, if he told you all, you must not blame him, he interrupted. He was very angry with me. He considered that I had behaved badly to you, and everybody, and I do not think that he weighed his words. Oh, I am not angry. Now that I think of it, what does it matter? I cannot help things, and the truth will out. Yes, he said, quite simply, we love each other, so we may as well admit it before we part. Yes, she echoed, without disturbance or surprise. I know now we love each other. These were the first intimate words that ever passed between them. This, their declaration, unusual even in the long history of the passions of men and women, and not the less so because neither of them seemed to think its fashion strange. "'It must have always been so,' said Morris. "'Always,' she answered. "'From the beginning, from the time you saved my life, and we were together in the boat, and, well, perhaps, who can say, before?' I, I can see it now. Only until they put light into our minds we did not understand. I suppose that sooner or later we should have found it out, for having been brought together, nothing could ever really have kept us asunder. Nothing but death, he answered heavily. Oh, that is your old error, the error of a lack of faith, she replied, with one of her bright smiles. Death will unite us beyond the possibility of parting. I pray God that it may come quickly, oh, to me, not to you. You have your life to lead, and mine is finished. I, I do not mean the life of my body, but the real life that within. I think that you are right. I grow sure of it. But here th there is nothing to be done. Of course, she answered eagerly, nothing. Do you suppose that I wish to suggest such a treachery? No, you are too pure and, and good. Good. I am not. Well, who is? But believe me that I am pure. It is bitter, groaned Morris. Why, why so? My heart aches, and yet through the pain I rejoice, because I know that it is well with us. Had you not loved me, then it would have been bitter. Oh, the rest is little. Oh, what does it matter when and how and where it comes about? Today we part, for ever in the flesh. You will not look upon this mortal face of mine again. Oh, why do you say so? Because I feel that it is true. He glanced up hastily, and she answered the question in his eyes. No, indeed, not that. I never thought of such a thing. I think it a crime. We are bid to endure the burden of our day. I shall go on weaving my web and painting my picture till, sooner or later, God says, Hold, and then I shall die gladly. Yes very gladly, because the real beginning is at hand. Oh, that I had your perfect faith, groaned Morris. Then, if you love me, learn it from me. Should I, 
of all people tell you what is not true it is the truth i swear it is the truth i am not deceived i know i know i know what do you know about us that when it is over we shall meet again where there is no marriage where there is nothing gross where love perfect and immortal reigns and passion is forgotten there that we love each other will make no heart sore not even hers whom here perhaps we have wronged there will be no jealousies since each and all themselves happy in their own and according to their own destinies will rejoice in the happiness of others there too our life will be one life our work one work our thought one thought nothing more shall separate us at all in that place where there is no change or shadow of turning therefore and she clasped her hands and looked upwards her face shining like a saint's although the tears ran down it therefore o oh death where is thy sting o oh grave where is thy victory you talk like one upon the verge of it who hears the beating of death's wings oh, it frightens me stella i know nothing of that it may be to-night or fifty years hence we are always on the verge and those wings i have heard from childhood fifty even seventy years and after them all oh, the infinite one tiny grain of sand compared to the bed of the great sea that sea from which it was washed at dawn to be blown back again at nightfall but the dead forget in that land all things are forgotten were you to die i should call to you and you would not answer and when my time came i might look for you and never find you how dare you say it if i die search and you shall see no do not search wait at your death i will be with you oh whatever happens in life or death here or hereafter swear that you will not forget me and that you will love me only oh swear it stella come come to this altar she said and when she had thought a moment now give me your hand so now before my maker and the presences who surround us i marry you morris monk oh not in the flesh with your flesh i have nothing to do but in the spirit i take your soul to mine i give my soul to yours yours it was from its birth's day yours it is and when it ceases to be yours let it perish everlastingly oh so be it to both of us for ever and for ever this then was their marriage and as they walked hand in hand away from the ancient altar which surely had been so strange a right there returned to morris an idle fantasy which had entered his mind at this very spot when they landed one morning half frozen after the night in the open boat but he said nothing of it for with the memory came a recollection of certain wandering words which that same day fell from stella's lips words at the thought of which his spirit thrilled and his flesh shuddered what if she were near it or he were near it or both of them what if this solemn ceremony of marriage mocked yet made divine 
had taken place upon the very threshold of its immortal consummation. She read his thoughts and answered, Remember always, far and near, it is the same thing. Time is nothing. This oath of ours cannot be touched by time or earthly change. I will remember, he answered. What more did they say? He could never be sure, nor does it matter, for what is written bears its gist. Go away first, she said presently. I promised your father that I would bring no further trouble on you, so we must not be seen together. Oh, go now, for the gale is rising fast and the darkness grows. Oh, this is hard to bear, he muttered, setting his teeth. Are you sure that we shall not meet again in after years? I am sure. You look your last upon me, on the earthly Stella, whom you know and love. It must be done, he said. It must be done, she echoed. Good-bye, husband. Till that appointed hour of meeting, when I may call you so without shame. And she held out her hand. He took and pressed it. Speak, he could not. Then, like a man stricken in years, he passed down the church with bent head and shambling feet. At the door he turned to look at her. She was standing erect and proud as a conqueror, her hand resting upon the altar. Even at that distance their eyes met, and in hers, lit with a wild and sudden ray from the sinking sun, he could see a strange light shine. Then he went out of the door and dragged it too behind him, to battle his way homeward through the roaring gale that stung and buffeted him like all the gathered spites and hammerings of destiny. This then was their parting, a parting pure and stern and high, unsolaced by one soft word, unsweetened by a single kiss. Yet it seems fitting that those who hope to meet in the light of the Spirit should make their last farewells on earth beneath such solemn shadows. And Stella? After all, she was but a woman, a woman with a very human heart. She knew the truth indeed, to whom it was given to see before the due determined time of vision. But still she was troubled with that human heart, and weighed down by the flesh over which she triumphed. Now that he was gone, pride and strength seemed both to leave her, and with a low cry, like the cry of a wounded seabird, she cast herself down there upon the cold stones, before the altar, and wept till her senses left her. The great gale roared and howled, the waters, driven onwards by its furious breath, beat upon the eastern cliffs till these melted like snow beneath them, taking their field and church, town and protecting wall, and in return casting up the wrecks of ships and the bodies of dead men. Morris could not sleep. Who could sleep in such an awful tempest? Who could sleep that had passed through such a parting? Oh, his heart ached, and he was once sick to death, and with him continually was the thought of Stella, and before him came the vision of her eyes. He could not sleep, so rising he dressed himself and went to the window. High in the heavens, swept clean of clouds by the furious blast, floated a wandering moon, throwing her ghastly light upon the swirling furious sea, shorewards rushed in great rollers in unending lines, there to break in thunder and seethe across the shingle till the sea-walls stopped them, 
and sent the spray flying upwards in thin white clouds. Oh, God help those in the power of the sea to-night, thought Morris, for many of them will not keep Christmas here. Then it seemed to his mind, excited by storm and sorrow, as though some power were drawing him, as though some voice were telling him that there was that which he must hear. Aimlessly, half unconsciously, he wandered to his workshop in the old chapel, turned on one of the lamps, and stood at the window watching the majestic progress of the storm, and thinking, thinking, thinking. While he remained thus, suddenly, thrilling his nerves as though with a quick shock of pain, sharp and clear, even in that roar and turmoil, rang out the sound of the electric bell. He started round and looked. Yes, as he thought, in all the laboratory there was only one bell that could ring. None other had its batteries charged, and that bell was attached to the aerophone whereof the twins stood upon the altar of the dead church. The instrument was one with the pair with which he had carried out his experiments of the last two months. His heart stood still. Great God! What could have caused that bell to ring? It could not ring. It was a physical impossibility unless somebody were handling the sister instrument. And at four o'clock in the morning, who could be there? And except one who would know its working? With a bound he was by the aerophone and had given the answering signal. Then instantly, as though she was standing at his side in the room, for this machine does not blur the voice or heighten its tone, he heard Stella speaking. "'Is it you who answer me?' she asked. "'Yes, yes,' he said. "'But where are you at this hour of the night?' where you left me, in the dead church," floated back the quick reply through the raving's breaths of storm. "'Listen! After you went my strength gave out, and I suppose that I, I fainted. At least a little while ago I woke up from a deep sleep to find myself lying before the altar here. I, I was frightened for I knew that it must be far into the night, and an awful gale is blowing which shakes the whole church. I went to the door and opened it, and by the light of the moon I saw that between me and the shore lies a raging sea, hundreds of yards wide. Then I came back and threw out my mind to you, and tried to wake you, if you slept try to make you understand that I wished you to go to the airphone and hear me. I, I will get help at once, broke in Morris. I beg you, came back the voice, I beg you, do not stir. The time is very short. Already the waves are dashing against the walls of the chancel, and I hear the water rumbling in the vaults beneath my feet. Oh, listen! Her voice ceased, and in place of it there swelled the shriek of the storm which beat about the dead church. The rush, too, of the water in the hollow vaults and the crashing of the old coffins as they were washed from their niches. Another instant, and Stella had cut off these sounds and was speaking again. It is useless to think of help. No boat, nothing could live upon the fearful sea. Moreover, within five minutes, this church must fall and vanish. Oh, my God, my God, wailed Morris. Oh, do not grieve. It is a waste of precious time, and do not stir till the end. I want you to know that I did not seek this death. I never dreamed of such a thing. You must tell my father so, and bid him not to mourn for me. It was my intention to leave the church within ten minutes of yourself. This cup is given to me by the hand of fate. 
I did not fill it. Do you hear and understand? I hear, I understand, answered Morris. Now you see, she went on, that our talk to-day was almost inspired. My web is woven, my picture is painted, and to me heaven says, Hold! The thought that it might be so was in your mind, was it not? Yes, and I answered your thought, telling you that time is nothing. This I tell you again for your comfort in the days that remain to you of life. Oh, I bless God, I bless God who has dealt so mercifully to me. Where are now the long years of lonely suffering that I feared? I who stand upon the threshold of the eternal. I can talk no more. The water is rising in the church. Already it is about my knees. But remember every word which I have said to you. Remember that we are wed, truly wed, that I go to wait for you, and that even if you do not see me, I will, if I may, be near you always, till you die, and afterwards will be with you always, always. Stay, cried Morris. What have you to say? Be swift, the water rises, and the walls are cracking. That I love you now, and for ever and for ever, that I will remember everything, and that I know beyond a doubt that you have seen, and speak the truth. Oh, thank you for those blessed words, and for this life. Fare you well. For a moment there was silence, or at least Stella's voice was silent, while Morris stood over the aerophone, the sweat running from his face, rocking like a drunken man in his agony, and waiting for the end. Then suddenly, loud, clear, and triumphant, broke upon his ears the sound of that song which he had heard her sing upon the sinking ship when her death seemed near. The ancient song of the overlord. Once more, at the last mortal ebb, while the water rose about her breast, Stella's instinct and blood had asserted themselves, and forgetting aught else, she was dying as her pagan forefathers had died, with the secret ancient chant upon her lips. Yes, she sang as Scarpedin, the hero sang while the flame ate out his life. The song swelled on, and the great waters boomed an accompaniment. Then came a sound of crashing walls, and for a moment it ceased, only to rise again still clearer and more triumphant. Again a crash, a seething hiss, and the instrument was silent, for its twin was shattered. Shattered also was the fair shape that held the spirit of Stella. Again and again Morris spoke eagerly, entreatingly, but the air of foam was dumb. So we ceased at length, and even then well nigh laughed when he thought that in this useless piece of mechanism he saw a symbol of his own soul, which also had lost its mate and could hold true converse with no other. Then he started up, and just as he was, ran out into the raving night. Three hours later, when the sun rose upon Christmas Day, if any had been there to note him, they might have seen a dishevelled man standing alone upon a lonely shore. There he stood, the backwash of the mighty combers hissing about his knees, as he looked seaward beneath the hollow of his hand at a spot some two hundred yards away, where one by one their long lines were broken into a churning yeast of foam. Morris knew well what broke them, 
the fallen ruins of the church that was now Stella's sepulchre. And, oh, in that dark hour, he would have been glad to see where she lay. End of chapter 16 Recording by Patrick 79Chapter 17 of Stella Fragelius by H. Ryder Haggard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Patrick 79. Chapter 17 The Return of Mary. Curiously enough, indirectly, but in fact, it was the circumstance of Stella's sudden and mysterious death that made Morris a rich and famous man, and caused his invention of the aerophone to come into common use. Very early on the following morning, but not before, she was missed from the rectory and sought far and wide. One of the first places visited by those who searched was the abbey, whither they met Morris, returning through the gale wild-eyed, flying-haired, and altogether strange to see. They asked him if he knew what had become of Miss Fregelius. Yes, he replied, she has been crushed or drowned in the ruins of the dead church, which was swept away by the gale last night. Then they stared and asked how he knew this. He answered that, being unable to sleep that night on account of the storm, he had gone into his workshop, when his attention was suddenly attracted by the bell of the aerophone, by means of which he learned that Miss Fregelius had been cut off from the shore in the church. He added that he ran as hard as he could to the spot, only to find at dawn that the building had actually entirely vanished in the gale, and that the sea had encroached upon the land by at least two hundred paces. Of course these statements concerning the aerophone and its capabilities were reported all over the world, and much criticised, oh, very roughly in some quarters. Thereupon Morris offered to demonstrate the truth of what he had said. The controversy proved sharp, but of this he was glad. It was solace to him. Perhaps even it prevented him from plunging headlong into madness. At first he was stunned. He did not feel very much. Then the first effects of the blow passed. A sense of the swiftness and inevitableness of this awful consummation seemed to sink down into his heart and crush him. The completeness of the tragedy its Greek play qualities, were overwhelming. Question and answer, seed and fruit. There was no space for thought or growth between them. The curtain was down upon the temporal, and, lo, almost before its folds had shaken to their place, it had risen upon the eternal. His nature reeled beneath its knowledge and his loss. Had it not been for those suspicions and attacks, it might have fallen. The details of the struggle need not be entered into, as they have little to do with the life story of Morris Monk. It is enough to say that in the end he more than carried out his promises under the severest conditions, and in the presence of various scientific bodies and other experts. Afterwards they came to the natural results. The great aerophone company was floated, in which Morris, as vendor, received half the shares. He would take no cash. Which shares, by the way, soon stood at five and a quarter. Also he found himself a noted man, was asked to deliver an address before the British Association, was nominated on the council of a leading scientific society, and, in due course, after a year or two, received one of the greatest compliments that can be paid to an Englishman, that of being elected to its fellowship, as a distinguished person, 
by the committee of a famous club. Thus did Morris prosper greatly, oh, very greatly, and in many different ways. But with all this part of his life we are scarcely concerned. On the day of his daughter's death Morris visited Mr. Fregelius, for whom he had a message. He found the old man utterly crushed and broken. "'The last of the blood, Mr. Monk,' he moaned. When Morris, hoarse-voiced and slow-worded, had convinced him of the details of the dreadful fact, "'The last of the blood, and I, left childless, at least you will feel for me, and with me. You will understand. It will be seen that although outside of some loose talk in the village, which indirectly had produced results so terrible, no one had ever suggested such a thing, curiously enough, by some intuitive process, Mr. Fregelius, who, to a certain extent at any rate, guessed his daughter's mind, took it for granted that she had been in love with Morris. He seemed to know also by the same deductive process that he was attached to her. "'I do indeed,' said Morris, with a sad smile, thinking that if only the clergyman could look into his heart, he would perhaps be somewhat astonished at the depth of that understanding sympathy. I, I told you, went on Mr. Fregelius, and you laughed at me, that it was most unlucky her having sung that hateful Norse song, the greeting to death, when you found her upon the steamer Trondheim. Everything has been unlucky, Mr. Fregelius. Or lucky, he added beneath his breath. But you would like to know that she died singing it. The aerophone told me that. Oh, Mr. Monk, the old man said, catching his arm, my daughter was a strange woman, a very strange woman. And since I heard this dreadful news, I have been afraid that perhaps she was unhappy. She was leaving her home, on your account. Yes, on your account. It's no use pretending otherwise, although no one ever told me so, and that she knew the church was going to be washed away. She thought you might think so, answered Morris, and he gave him Stella's last message. Moreover, he told him more of the real circumstances than he revealed to anybody else. He told him what nobody else ever knew, for on that lonely coast none had seen him enter or leave the place. How he had met her in the church, about the removal of the instruments as he left it to be inferred, and at her wish had come home alone because of the gossip which had arisen. He explained also that according to her own story, from some unexplained cause, she had fallen asleep in the church after his departure, and awakened to find herself surrounded by water, with all hope gone. And now she is dead, now she is dead, groaned Mr. Fregelius, and I am alone in the world. I am sorry for you said Morris simply. But there it is. It's no use looking backwards. We must look forward. Yes, look forward, both of us, since she is hidden from both. You see, almost from the first, I knew you were fond of her, added the clergyman simply. Yes, he answered, I am fond of her, though of that the less said the better. And because our case is the same, I hope that we shall always be friends. Oh, you are very kind. I shall need a friend now. I am alone now, 
quite alone, and my heart is broken. Here it may be added that Morris was even better than his word. Out of the wealth that came to him in such plenty, for instance, he was careful to augment the old man's resources, without offending his feelings, by adding permanently and largely to the endowment of the living. Also, he attended to his wants in many other ways which need not be enumerated, and not least by constantly visiting him. Many were the odd hours and the evenings that should be told of later, which they spent together smoking their pipes in the rectory study, and talking of her who had gone, and whose lost life was the strongest link between them. Otherwise and elsewhere, except upon a few extraordinary occasions, her name rarely passed the lips of Morris. Yet within himself he mourned, and mourned, although even in the first bitterness, not as one without hope, he knew that she had spoken truth, that she was not dead, but only for a while out of his sight and hearing. Ten days had passed, and for Morris ten weary, almost sleepless nights. The tragedy of the destruction of the new rector's daughter in the ruins of the dead church no longer occupied the tongues of men and paragraphs in paper. One day the sea gave up the hood of her brown ulster, the same that Morris had been seen arranging by Stephen and Eliza Layard. It was found upon the beach. After this even the local police admitted that the conjectures as to her end must be true, and since for the lack of anything to hold it on there could be no inquest, the excitement dwindled and died. Nor indeed, as her father announced, that he was quite satisfied as to the circumstances of his daughter's death, was any formal inquiry held concerning them. A few people, however, still believed that she was not really drowned, but had gone away secretly, for unknown private reasons. The world remembers few people, even if they be distinguished for ten whole days. It has not time for such long continual recollection of the dead, this world of the living who hurry on to join them. If this is the case with the illustrious, the wealthy and the powerful, how much more must it be so in the instance of the almost unknown girl, a stranger in the land? Morris and her father remembered her, for she was part of their lives and lived on with their lives. Stephen Layard mourned for the woman whom he had wished to marry, fiercely at first, with a sharp pain of disappointed passion, then intermittently. And at last, after he was comfortably wedded to somebody else, with a mild and sentimental regret three or four times a year. Eliza, too, when once convinced that she was really dead, was much shocked, and talked vaguely of the judgments and dispensations of providence, as though this victim were pre-eminently deserving of its most stern decrees. It was rumoured, however, among the observant that her Christian sorrow was, perhaps, tempered by a secret relief at the absence of a rival, who, as she now admitted, sang extremely well, and had beautiful eyes. The colonel also thought of the guest whom the sea had given, and taken away, and with a real regret, for this girl's force, talents, and loveliness had touched and impressed him who had sufficient intellect and experience to know that she was a person cast in a rare and noble mould. But to Morris he never mentioned her name. No further confidence had passed between them on the matter. Yet he knew to his son this name was holy. 
therefore being in some ways a wise man, he thought it well to keep his lips shut, and to let the dead bury their dead. By all the rest, Stella Fregelius was soon as much forgotten as though she had never walked the earth or breathed its air. That gale had done much damage, and had taken away many lives. All down the coast was heard the voice of mourning. Hers chanced to be one of them, and there was nothing to be said. On the morning of the eleventh day came a telegram from Mary, addressed to Morris, and dated from London. It was brief and to the point. "'Come to dinner with me at Seaview, and bring your father, Mary.' When Morris drove to Seaview that evening, he was as a man in a dream. Sorrow had done its work on him, agonizing his nerves, till at length they seemed to be blunted as with a very excess of pain, much as the nerves of the victims of the Inquisition were sometimes blunted, till at length they could scarcely feel the pincers bite or the irons burn. Always abstemious also, for his last twelve days he had scarcely swallowed enough food to support him, with the result that his body weakened and suffered with his mind. Then there was a third trouble to contend with, the dull and gnawing sense of shame, which seemed to eat into his heart. In actual fact, he had been faithful enough to Mary, but in mind he was most unfaithful. How could he come to her, the woman who was to be his wife, the woman who had dealt so well by him, with the memory of that spiritual marriage at the altar of the dead church, still burning in his brain? That marriage which now was consecrated and immortalized by death. What had he to give her that was worth her taking? He, who, if the truth were known, shrank from all idea of union with an earthly woman, who longed only to be allowed to live out his time in a solitude as complete as he could find or fashion. It was monstrous, it was shameful. And then and there he determined that before ever he stood in Monksland's church by the side of Mary Porson, at least he would tell her the truth and give her leave to choose. To his other sins against her, deceit should not be added. "'Might I suggest, Morris,' said the Colonel, who as they drove had been watching his son's face furtively by the light of the Bruffham's lamp, uh, "'might I suggest that, under all circumstances, Mary would perhaps appreciate an air of um, a little less reminiscent of funerals? You may recollect that several months have passed since you parted.' "'Yes,' said Morris, "'and a great deal has happened in that time. Oh, of, of course, of course!' "'Her father is dead,' the Colonel alluded to no other death. "'Poor Porson! How painfully that beastly window in the dining-room will remind me of him! "'Now come, here we are. Pull yourself together, old fellow!' Morris obeyed as best he could, and presently found himself following the Colonel into the drawing-room. For once in his life, as he reflected, heartily glad to have the advantage of his parents' society, he could scarcely be expected to be very demonstrative and lover-like under the fire of that observant eyeglass. As they entered the drawing-room, by one door, Mary, looking very handsome and imposing in a low black dress, which became her fair beauty admirably, appeared at the other. Catching sight of Morris, she ran, or rather glided, forwards with a graceful gait that was one of her great distinctions, and caught him by both hands, bending her face towards him in an open and unmistakable invitation. In a moment it was over somehow, and she was saying, 
oh morris how thin you look and there are great black lines under your eyes uncle what have you been doing to him uh, uh, when i have had the pleasure of saying how do you do to you my dear he replied in a somewhat offended voice for the colonel was not fond of being overlooked even in favour of an interesting son i should be happy to do my best to answer your question oh i am so sorry she said advancing her forehead to be kissed but we saw each other the other day didn't we and one can't embrace two people at once and of course one must begin somewhere but why have you made him so thin the colonel surveyed morris critically with his eyeglass really my dear mary he replied i am not responsible for the variations in my son's habit of body then as morris turned away irritably he added in a stage whisper he's been a bit upset poor fellow he felt your father's death dreadfully mary winced a little then recovering her vivacity said oh, well at any rate uncle i am glad to see that nothing of the sort has affected your health i never saw you looking better ah my dear as we grow older we learn resignation and how to look after ourselves thought mary at that moment dinner was announced and she went in on morris's arm the colonel gallantly insisting that it should be so after this things progressed a good deal better the first plunge was over and the cool refreshing waters of mary's conversation seemed to give back to morris's system some of the tone that it had lost also when he thought fit to use it he had a strong will and he thought fit this night lastly like many a man in a quandary before him he discovered the strange advantages of a scientific but liberal absorption of champagne mary noticed this as she noticed everything and said presently with her eyes wide open uh, might i ask my dear if you are ill you are eating next to nothing and that's your fourth large glass of champagne you who never drank more than two don't you remember how it used to vex my poor dad because he said that it always meant half a bottle wasted and a temptation to the cook morris laughed he was able to laugh by now and replied as it happened with perfect truth that he had an awful toothache oh then everything is explained said mary did you ever see me with a toothpaste well i should advise you not for it would be our last interview i will paint it for you after dinner with pure carbolic acid it's splendid that is if you don't drop it on any patient's tongue morris answered that he would stick to champagne then mary began to narrate her experiences in the convent in a fashion so funny that the colonel could scarcely control his laughter and even morris toothache heartache and all was genuinely amused imagine my dear morris she said you know the time i get down to breakfast or perhaps you don't it's one of those things which i have been careful to conceal from you but you will one day and i believe that over it our matrimonial happiness may be wrecked well at what hour do you think i found myself expected to be up at the convent uh, seven suggested morris at seven at a quarter to five if you please at a quarter to five every morning did some wretched person come and ring a dinner bell outside my door and it was no use going to sleep again not the least for at half-past five two hideous old lay sisters arrived with buckets of water they have a perfect passion for cleanliness and began to scrub out the cell whether you were in bed or whether you weren't then she rattled on to other experiences trivial enough in themselves 
but so entertaining when touched and lightened by her native human, that very soon the evening had worn itself pleasantly away without a single sad or untoward word. "'Good night, dear,' said Mary to Morris, who this time managed to embrace her with becoming warmth. "'You will come and see me to-morrow, won't you? No, not in the morning. Remember, I have been getting up at quarter to five for a month, and I am trying to equalise matters. But after luncheon, then we will sit before a good fire and have a talk, for the weather is so delightfully bad that I am sure I shan't be forced to take exercise. Oh, very well, at three o'clock, said Morris, when the Colonel, who had been reflected to himself, broke in. Uh, uh, look here, my dear, you must be down to lunch, or if you are not, you ought to be. So, as I want to have a chat with you about some of your poor father's affairs, and am engaged for the rest of the day, I will come over then, if you will allow me. Oh, certainly, uncle, if you like. But wouldn't Morris do instead, as representing me, I mean? Oh, yes, he answered. When you are married, he will do perfectly well. But until that happy event, I am afraid that I must take your personal opinion. Oh, very well, said Mary with a sigh. I will expect you at a quarter past one. End of chapter 17 Recording by Patrick 79